Good to see you again, uh, everybody. I want to start with a personal uh, story, slightly personal story from Thursday this week, actually. Uh, Simon Middleton's um, funeral up at the, the crematorium in the morning and then a uh, big gathering in here. And um, uh, many of you will know what I'm talking about. If you don't, Simon, a long-term member of this church family who tragically was killed um, in an accident uh, three weeks ago and, uh, and a big gathering in here. And it was a very, very special occasion. Thank you to, to the many, many of you who either prayed or helped or served or were just part of that occasion. It was special. Um, but Hills in the morning, had, uh, had a, she was praying for me, and she'd had a picture, actually, a sense from, from the Lord at the beginning of the day that she shared with me. And the picture was of a sort of old-fashioned army camp, a military camp, with some rather tired and depleted soldiers in this camp, just sort of sitting around, as it were. And then in the middle of the camp, the standard, you know, the, the, the banner was being raised up the flagpole right in the middle of the camp. And it, it had this sort of galvanizing effect. It was clearly something that was inspiring and literally um, attractive in the sense that it attracted attention in, in this arena. The banner of God was to be raised over the gatherings on Thursday, whilst honoring Simon rightly and appropriately, God was going to be exalted, that was the word she, she particularly had, in the midst of the gathering for all to see, for all those who are mourning um, Simon and his loss and all the emotions that go with that kind of tragic, tragic bereavement. And it was a special day. And then at the end, somebody came up to uh, Hills and me and had said how they appreciated the occasion, how wonderful it all was. And as we had honored Simon... And as we had uh, worshipped and prayed and lent into God's word, she said, the Lord was just so exalted in the middle of it all. It's the word she used. So exalted, so raised up, lifted up in a way that was inspiring and attractive. And it was just, of course, it was a, a, a personal, lovely encouragement to me, but it was a really significant one. And of course, it's always significant. It's always true. I want to speak about one word today, just one word. And it comes in the context of a really beautiful song that I want you to turn to in your Bibles if you've got one with you or got a device that you can find a Bible on or just Google it. It's a beautiful song. It's often quoted this time of year for obvious reasons. It's the Song of Mary, and it's told in Luke chapter 1. So if you'd be finding Luke chapter 1, uh, I, I'm not going to put it on the screens. I'm trying a new thing at the moment by not putting the Bible readings on the screen just to see if that can encourage us to bring Bibles and, and open them ourselves. If you don't like that, come and moan at me afterwards. Or moan at Andrew. <laughs> I'm, I am going to read the song uh, in, in a moment. Um, and I suspect some of you already know, you've already guessed which word might be the word I'm going to draw our attention to. Some of you have got a good idea. Just let me remind you of the context. The context, of course, is that the angel Gabriel has told Mary that she's going to give birth to the Son of God, the promised Messiah. He's going to be the saviour of the world. And she's pretty overwhelmed, wouldn't you be, uh, by this uh, enormous news. But she has... This incredible assurance, verse 37 of Luke 1, nothing is impossible with God. No word of God will ever fail, says Gabriel. It's not gonna, this is going to happen. No word of God will ever fail. And she responds, verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. Love that. We love the humility about Mary, don't we? Precious humility. No wonder the Lord was able to entrust this woman with this news, with this gift, with this uh, opportunity, as it were, this occasion. Humility is the condition of her heart. It, it's the condition of our heart, by the way, when the soil of our heart is fertile. That's what humility is. It's when the soil of our heart is fertile to receive the gift from God, to receive the word from God. It's ready to receive from the Lord whatever he offers, whatever he says, whether it's comforting, whether it's challenging, whatever. And she says, may your word to me be fulfilled. And now she's visiting her cousin Elizabeth, who's pregnant with the baby who's going to become John the baptizer, John the Baptist, as Anna's been reminding us. And Elizabeth's cousin, she's also overwhelmed by the whole thing. And she says about Mary, verse 45, so blessed is this woman, so blessed is she, who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Mary's faithfulness 
Not just her humility, but her faithfulness, full of faith. She has a history with God, this woman. We can tell. We don't know much about it, but we can tell, can't we? Mary has history with God. She knows her Old Testament scriptures. There's more than an echo, by the way, in this song of references to to Hannah in the Old Testament. You remember who had the, the, the baby Samuel and dedicated him to the Lord in the temple. She knows what's going on here. She knows that God is showing her favor. She knows, comes to realize that God has chosen her to bring the savior of his people into the world. She takes the Lord at his word. She believes him. So much loaded into that word. She trusts him for all the overwhelmness of her emotions. So humility, faithfulness. I don't know how you imagine what happens next, those of you who are familiar with this passage. Luke, the doctor, rather calmly says, Mary said, I prefer to believe that she sang. We know it as Mary's song. I prefer to imagine that she sang at the top of her voice, kind of chasing her very pregnant cousin Elizabeth round the kitchen table, throwing stuff in the air and having a bit of a party. I could be wrong. If that's not putting thought to you, ditch it. But I think she did a bit more than just say these words. And here then is her outpouring of thanks and praise, full of passion, full of depth, full of truth. She's humble, she's faithful, she's thankful. Powerful combination, by the way. Humility, thankfulness, faithfulness. So verses 46 to 55, my soul, she sings, magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He's looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He's shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent empty away. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to, to Abraham, to his offspring forever. Familiar to some, I'm sure you'll know that some of these songs in the Bible, for some reason that I'm never quite sure, are still referred to by their Latin names. Seems an odd thing to do. And and generally they sound terrible. Uh, There's one called the Nunc Dimittis. Remember that one? The Nunc Dimittis. Much better in English. In Latin it just sounds like something to, some sort of medication. Take some Nunc Dimittis. Or or there's one which is even worse. It's referred referred to, and I kid you not, ironically as the Tedium. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, some of us are nodding in appreciation from old memories. But this one has got a Latin name. You probably remember this. Do you know what it's called, this song? Remember? Yeah, the Magnificat. That's a good word, isn't it? This is the Magnificat. Why my soul magnifies the Lord. In some versions, exalts, lifts up, glorifies, lifts up, raises up like that banner in the middle of the camp. So we're going to stick with magnify. That's the word. I was at um, Brasserie Blanc about three years ago, three or four years ago, with some friends, four, three or four friends, and uh, we're, we're settling down to the meal, all sitting around the meal, uh, around, around the table. There are menus there, and literally all of my friends and, and my wife got out their, their glasses at that point in order to read the menu. I was in my stubborn phase, not needing glasses at that point, so I just got my phone out and, and shone the torch, because as far as I was concerned, there was nothing wrong with my eyes, it was just that the lighting was a bit dim. At which point, to my right, the the waiter has sidled up, and in his hand he had seven pairs of reading glasses. (laughs) Would sir like one of these? (laughs) They were left behind by previous customers. You're very welcome to take all of them if you want. (laughs) And uh, my stubbornness continued for a little bit, but I I, I then had to sort of succumb and admit, admit defeat. We, and, and of course, they, they, they magnified the menu. Was the menu, did the menu change size? No. I mean, let's, let's kind of just clock that bit. It wasn't that by putting the glasses on, the menu you know, itself changes size. No. Uh, it, when we magnify the Lord, it's ridiculous to think that we'd be making God bigger. He's already, you know, so far uh, beyond our comprehension in so many ways. His thoughts higher than ours, his ways higher than ours. But. As we magnify him, to magnify him is then to focus on him in such a way that he becomes bigger and more dominant in our thoughts and in our mindset and in our attitudes, in the way that we see, in the way that we think, in our affections, in our imagination, and therefore more dominant in our attitudes and our choices and the daily decisions that we make every day. That is to magnify God. We become aware more of of aspects of his nature and his character as we do that. They become clearer to us. 
our awareness of his, of his presence grows, doesn't it? As we magnify him. Our expectations of his activity in the world, in our lives, around us, gets larger. Our sensitivity to his voice increases. We've already prayed about that. He, what he says becomes more distinct and influential than the other voices. So that's a lot of good things going on, isn't it? When we magnify the Lord, all of those different things happen. So I'm going to say a pretty healthy self-assessment question would be this, wouldn't it? Or, or perhaps a better a, a prayer, healthy prayer, to be asking the Holy Spirit regularly, Lord, show me what I am magnifying in my life right now. What am I magnifying in my life right now? Show me when I'm magnifying anything in a way that is somehow unhelpful or just plain wrong, or anything which undermines my trust in you? I think that's a really healthy question. I'm a big fan of maps. Um, I'm sure we all are. I love the online maps, Google Earth, and all those sorts of things. And I love that thing where you, 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 you pick the landscape, and then you click on that little icon, which has got the plus sign in it, because it, you know, it zooms in. And, make, and I z- you zoom in on something in, in my idle moments. I'll zoom in on you know, my mother's house in her village in Dorset, or whatever, or um, my favorite palm tree on a lovely beach somewhere. Um, or my favorite of all, of course, the, the Emirates Stadium in North London. Just zoom in. Yeah, I see, I see. Andrew, Andrew's with me on that. What's going on? Arsenal are winning again. But in the landscape of my life and yours, by the way, we find it relatively easy, I think, to zoom in on some things that are not worthy of that zooming in, if I can put it like that. I can zoom in and enlarge my fears. I can zoom in and enlarge all of my needs. I can zoom in and enlarge my weaknesses or even things like crises in the world or bad news or negative reports. How about over-magnifying my grievances or my complaints or my criticisms? Anybody familiar with that? I might over-magnify my my responsibilities, over-magnify them, over-magnify my failures, what's gone wrong, over-magnify my reputation, my appetite for pleasure or for... For, for comfort or success or approval or whatever. And, and all of those are real enough, and in a sense, they all have their place, but that's the whole point. They need their right place, don't they? Not an over-magnified place, not a magnified place. So, 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 so think about this. Pick an enemy right now. I think the Holy Spirit will give us each an enemy. In, I don't mean a person. People are never the enemy. But an enemy to you in your life, one that you're familiar with. Maybe it's a sense of low worth that you live with or uh, an anxiety, or a poverty mindset, or the sense of uh, I'm a victim, or you're easily offended, that kind of enemy. Think of one of the the enemies that is is your regular and unwelcome companion, insecurity perhaps, or an enduring problem. Every time we magnify that enemy, whatever that is, we are at the same time saying this, God, you are too small. When we magnify our enemies, we are at the same time saying, God, you're too small. That's quite shocking, isn't it? I almost dare you to say it. I mean, not now, but, you know, when you become aware of these things. Because I think to say it is to appreciate the, the reality of that. God, you are too small. You are not enough. You are not big enough to help me with this problem, is what we're really saying. When we magnify the problem. And minimize God. You're not big enough to help me with the problem. You're not strong enough to help me overcome my fears. You're not generous enough to provide for me when I feel a lack. You're not reassuring enough to speak into my sense of insecurity. You're not merciful enough to help me forgive that person who's hurt me. You're not present enough to make a difference to my loneliness. You're not powerful enough to see me through this crisis. God, you are not enough. You are too small. I find that, of course, challenging. But it is the compelling reality of what we're, what we're doing when we magnify those things and minimize him. And so we need to admit that to ourselves. We need to confess that to God when we, when we find ourselves doing that. That that's what we're doing. When we magnify things that are not to be magnified in place of magnifying the one who is to be magnified. And that's the Lord. So 12, 12 spies go into Cain, an example of this. Plenty in the Bible. 12 spies, they all see the same thing. They see a big bunch of grapes and a big bunch of monsters. Angry looking monsters. Ten of them... Magnify the monsters. We're going to get smashed. Yes, God may have told us that we're going to take this land, but he must be wrong. He's too small, is what they were saying, isn't it? Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they see a whole different set, through a different set of lenses. They see the same thing. 
but they magnify the Lord. Yes, he's told us that God's told us that we're going to take this land. He's going to empower us. So the monsters may be big, but our God is bigger. That's what they see. They magnify God and not the monsters. Same with David and Goliath. What did David see? He saw a big God and a small man with a big mouth, basically. Same with Elijah. Lovely story in 2 Kings 6. Read it if you're not familiar with this one. The enemy surrounded them uh, on all sides. And that's what Elijah's servant saw because he magnified the opposition. All he could see was the opposition uh, surrounding them. But Elijah, because he magnified God, with that lens, he could see that, yes, there was opposition, but bigger and stronger behind the, the invaders was this heavenly divine army, angelic army, that in the end defeated the enemies. Far outnumbered them, far overpowered them. I think I said, I can't remember if I said this before, so forgive me if I told it. The Macedonia, where we were a few weeks ago, is a mountainous country, and lots of the towns are surrounded by hills. We're in a particular uh, town which, which felt very sort of downtrodden, uh, and I found myself sensing from God this, this idea that, yeah, physically you're surrounded by mountains. It feels like you're surrounded by enemies, it feels like you're surrounded by things that um, are crushing you and keeping you low. And by the way, in the Bible, mountains are often a, an expression, a, a sign of, of things that are challenging. Uh, but like Mary, we want to say no word of God will fail, that, that, that uh, all things are possible with God. We trust you, God, that you are bigger than all of this. And, and there are promises to, to be uh, held on to here. It may look like I'm surrounded in the line of the song. It may look like we're surrounded, but we're surrounded by you. There's a bigger story going on. I wanted to encourage the Macedonians with that as I, as I do us here because we're magnifying the right thing, not the wrong thing. So f- just getting practical just for a few minutes. How? how? How are we magnifying the Lord? Lots and lots of ways, but I'm going to stick with Mary's ways um, from the text. So eyes down if you, if you want to refresh your, 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 your memory of the song. First, wearing the, what we call in this church the pink glasses of faith. It's a bit of an in, an in reference, but Hill stood here several years ago and wore these massive pink glasses, and they became the pink glasses of faith. I forgot to bring them down, but imagine. This is, faith is involved here, looking through eyes of faith. She had faith. Mary had faith. We're not talking about um, sort of optimistic thinking, religious optimism, wishful thinking, that kind of thing. Oh, I think, I hope it's going to be okay. Not that. No, through faith. This isn't about screwing up our eyes and trying very, very hard to see things differently. This is about engaging our spirit with the Holy Spirit, our inner eyesight with him, and exercising some faith muscles, choosing to trust the Lord in this. And that's a a learning process, isn't it? We're all learning. We're all growing. I hope we are. I hope we're, we're saying, Lord, I want more faith. I want to grow faith. How do I grow faith? The Bible says we grow faith by dwelling with him, by pushing into him, by opening his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing from the word of God, making room for him in our lives, having a strong biblical rule of life. I meant to, to wave the, the rule of life leaflet at us all. All of those things, our practices, help to encourage faith within us. And we need eyes of faith to see what can't be seen in the natural Mary did that. She'd been doing it for years. So it wasn't too hard for her to exercise faith and see it. And that's part of her magnifying. Part of her magnifying God was to exercise faith. Second, she praised the Lord. Clearly, major way of magnifying God. Quite straightforward. Not hard to understand. Worshipping him. Declaring true things about him, whether in word or song or, or whatever. Here we are, verse 49. Holy is his name, she says. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation and so on. Because praise honors the Lord, because he's worthy of all praise. But praise is also, for us, a weapon in our hands, as it was for her. It minimizes the enemies. It maximizes God, magnify God, and it minimizes the enemies rather than the other way around. Praise does that. So question for us, again, in our rule of life, as it were, how regular a feature is praise? And I don't just mean setting aside once a week when we come into this building and uh, and sing our worship songs, as brilliant as that that is. Has praise, regular praise, become a habit um, for us in in the way that we are? I love that our homes and our earphones are are often full of, of worship songs. Really, really good. Let's keep doing that. But listening to worship music, not quite the same as engaging our spirits in praising God, is it? It's kind of a quarter of the way there, but, you know, we need to engage if we're going to praise. Third, like Mary, we magnify the Lord as we grow in thanksgiving. A little bit different, remember, praise and thanksgiving. They, of course, they belong together. I don't want to make neat distinctions, but praise is something about who God is. Holy is your name. 
Thanksgiving tends more towards what you've done. Thank you for this. I mean, yes, thank you for who you are. So, so you know, there's overlap. But, but, so from small things to big things. And her, her song contains these two. And he's looked on the humble estate of his servant. You, thank you for looking on me. Thank you for you know, um, recognizing me. Thank you for calling me. He's shown strength with his arm. He's been strong. He's brought down the mighty. He's filled the hungry. He's helped his servant Israel just like he promised Abraham and so on. She's thanking God for all that he's done. Praising him for who he is, thanking him for what he's done. Again, I just want to ask, are we cultivating thanks? We say it often to each other. It sounds really obvious. Mary was praising and thanking, of course, from a place of excitement and, um, and joy and, and anticipation, I suppose, of, of everything that was going to happen, wasn't she? Positive emotions going on. Plenty of times that's not our emotion, but the scripture says, thank anyway. Choose thanks anyway, even in the tough times. Psalm 69 verse 30 says this, I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him, there's that word again, with thanksgiving. But that very same psalm begins like this, Save me, God, because the waters have come up to my neck. So Mary thanking because of good circumstances, if you like. Psalm 69, Psalm is thanking despite Bad circumstances. I'm up to my neck, but I'm still going to thank you. All points in between. We're not to, you know, we can we only thank when life is good. No, almost the opposite. Thanking despite, as well as thanking because. One Thessalonians five. Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because it honours the Lord. First of all, it honours the Lord. That's the reason for doing it. But actually, the benefit is it also helps us. It really helps us because it magnifies Him. It minimises the enemy. So much harder to be proud or selfish if we're being thankful, isn't it? Have you ever thought about that? Very difficult to be proud, to pat yourself on the back if you're truly thankful, expressing thanks. Very hard to feel self-pity, oh, poor old me, if at the same time you're thanking. Almost impossible, I think. Can't be a victim when you're thankful. And it's a real weapon against fear, which is one of our biggest enemies. As I said, choose an enemy. I know that half the room are thinking, I'm, fear- I'm fearful about this. I'm anxious about this. That's a regular enemy to some degree. I was reading this week, and hear me carefully on this, there's strong evidence that we can't be anxious and thankful at the same time, medically. Here is uh, a medical psychologist, Dan Baker. During active appreciation and thanksgiving, the threatening messages from your amygdala, that's the bit of the brain where we feel those emotions like fear, so the threatening messages from the amygdala and the anxious instincts of your brain stem are cut off suddenly and surely from access to your brain's neocortex, didn't think you'd hear these words this morning, did you? Where they, can, where they can fester, replicate themselves, and turn your stream of thoughts into a cold river of dread. It is therefore a fact of neurology that the brain cannot be in a state of appreciation and a state of fear at the same time. The two states may alternate, but they're mutually exclusive. That's very challenging to hear if you think about it. So are you saying that when I'm anxious, I'm, I'm, I can, I, because I'm an anxious person, I can never be a thankful person. No, of course not. I'm not a medical psychologist. But I think spiritually we can see, we can see this going on, can't we? In terms of tr- truly what's going on, what is dominating, we can't be anxious and thankful at the same time. There's lots of other studies that highlight how gratitude can be a sort of buffer uh, in, in this. Thanksgiving magnifies the Lord. Magnifies the Lord. Last one, seeing the bigger picture of what God is doing. Looking outwards, looking outwards magnifies the Lord. Mary recognized it's not all about her. I love this about her song. Sure, it starts with her. My soul magnifies the Lord and you've done these lovely things for me. But a lot of the song towards the end is not about her at all. She's, she's thinking about what God's done, what she's thankful for as she sees him in other people's lives. It's not all about us. <laughs> You know, magnifying us is a disaster. So God's done this. God's done that. He is all about, uh, in the last part of the, those verses, uh, bringing down um, those who are a bit up themselves and bringing up, oh, excuse me, those who are a bit downtrodden. I, lo- I love that. It, it, it's, we have a Bible study about all of that in itself. But we are not the center of our own worlds. We magnify the Lord when we serve others, when we love others, when we give, when we give op- provide opportunities to bless, when we pray in a thousand small ways, when we do that both inside and clearly outside of, uh, of the walls of the church, we're magnifying him. Those who don't know the Lord can't magnify him. Let's just end on this bit. 
Those who don't know Jesus cannot magnify him. They can't actually see him. They don't know his presence. They're blinded from the truth. That was us once. They don't know what he's like. They don't know what he's done. They don't know what he's capable of. They don't know the heart of the Father for them and a million other precious things that every human being needs to know on the face of the earth. They don't know. So where do they turn to form a view of who God is? Where do they get any notion of who God is by seeing what his kids look like? That's us. People see God initially, most of the time, by looking through the lens of his people, i.e. us, the church. So what kind of God are we displaying? Would be my final sort of question, really. What kind of God are we displaying? Are we displaying, would would they look at us and go, gosh, your God is really small. Your God is really small. I can see that your God is not big enough to sort your problems or not make much of a difference in your life. He can't be that important because I see you filling your lives with a whole load of other things and, and not this God that you, you sort of talk about. Um, maybe we don't talk about our God very much. So why would he, what kind of impression would we give? Maybe we seem to suggest that he's not got much power to change anything. Or do they begin to form that actually this Jesus of ours, this God of ours must be pretty amazing given the stories that we tell? given our testimony of him changing things in our lives or in our environment, given the stories we tell about the help that we've received from him or the healing that we've known or the transformation that has been a part of this community or through this community in other places, given the unusual generosity that we display, the unusual love and affection we show and compassion we show to those who don't look the same as us and who uh, may have different, different things going on in their lives that we show to insiders and outsiders, do they see that our God is big? Well, they will see that our God is big if we do what Mary did consistently, which is to magnify the Lord, to magnify the Lord. So let's join her. Let's join Mary in her humility, fertile soil, in her faithfulness, growing in faith, trusting the word of God, in her thankfulness, the expression of it always, and in our magnifying of the Lord. Amen.